So welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Dean Lee and I'm a professor of physics at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams at Michigan State University. Before I get to the introduction for today's talk, let me briefly mention some upcoming events. For those who are local to the Lansing area, there will be an in-person dance performance sponsored by the laboratory at 1 p.m. Sunday, November 6th, called Of Equal Place Isotopes in Motion at the Wharton Center in East Lansing, Michigan. So tickets are available at the Wharton Center. And the next Zoom public talk for those of you joining us online, well, actually all of us are joining us online. Uh, the next speaker is Ken Dill from Stony Brook University at 1 p.m. on Sunday, November 13th on a biophysical perspective on the origin of life. You'll see advertisements for this uh, talk later. Okay, now, Today's, today, uh, today's business, today's public talk is part of an initiative at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams called the Advanced Studies Gateway. The primary goal of the Advanced Studies Gateway is to inspire people. We bring together researchers, innovators, creative thinkers, artists, and performers from all fields and strengthen ties between Michigan State University and the community. Today, we have the great pleasure of presenting a public lecture by Professor Stephen Gervin entitled Progress and Prospects for the Second Quantum Revolution and the Race to Build Impossible Computers. Professor Gervin earned his PhD in theoretical physics from Princeton University. He joined the Yale faculty in 2001, where he is Eugene Higgins Professor of Physics and Professor of Applied Physics. From 2007 to 2017, he served as Yale's Deputy Provost for Research. From 2019 to 2021, he served as Founding Director of the Co-Design Center for Quantum Advantage, one of five national quantum information science research centers funded by the US Department of Energy. Along with his experimental colleagues, Michel Devore and Robert Sholkoff, Professor Girvin co-developed Circuit QED, the leading architecture for construction of quantum computers based on superconducting microwave circuits. Dr. Girvin is a foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. In 2007, he shared the Oliver E. Buckley Prize of the American Physical Society for work on the fractional quantum Hall effect. In 2019, he and co-author Kun Yang published the textbook, Modern Condensed Matter Physics with Cambridge University Press. If you have any clarifying questions during this talk, please type them into the chat or question and answer dialog box. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Gervin. Thank you very much, uh, Dean. Uh, Pleasure to be here, if only virtually. And uh, if there are uh, clarifying questions that come up during the talk, and I don't notice it in the chat, please uh, please relay them to me. So I'm going to talk to you about one of the what I think is one of the most exciting areas of uh, physics, engineering, and computer science, which is um, an ongoing second quantum revolution in which we've come to understand that we have not been taking advantage of the full power of quantum machines for processing and communicating and measuring. So I need to establish some vocabulary for, for non-physicists. So classical mechanics developed uh, 300 years ago and more by uh, Galileo and Newton primarily. Um, objects move in very well-defined and completely predictable trajectories determined by forces such as gravity acting on them. And through understanding this, uh, mankind has been able to uh, send satellites to explore other planets, to land people on the moon, uh, and so forth. 
uh, to understand the trajectories of comets and baseballs and other macroscopic objects. Uh, but classical mechanics, which is extremely accurate, uh, does fail in certain extreme limits of, for example, very small size and where the particles are not baseballs, but individual electrons or atoms. And quantum mechanics is a theory that has um, uh, subsumed classical mechanics. It makes the same predictions as Newton and Galileo for large objects, but very different and correct predictions at the atomic scale. It's the single most accurate theory in all of the physical uh, sciences, but it has some very strange features. Particles do not have well-defined trajectories. In fact, you can one uh, version of quantum mechanics developed by Richard Feynman, particles take all possible trajectories. In, in another version developed by Schrodinger, particles act like waves and they exhibit wave-like interference where uh, waves can add or uh, uh, constructively or destructively. And in, in the classical picture of an atom, an electron, say, orbiting a proton and a hydrogen atom would have a planetary orbit obeying the same equations as the Earth going around the sun under the influence of gravity. But here, the electron is uh, uh, being attracted to the proton, not by gravity, uh, but by um, uh, the electric force. Uh, but quantum mechanics is a different picture of this in which the orbits are, are wave-like and fuzzy. So I'll call, I'll refer to classical computers as ordinary electrical or mechanical devices that follow the laws of classical mechanics. So your cell phone and your laptop and desktop computers are classical computers. I'm going to be talking to you about quantum computers, a completely new type of device based on the laws of quantum mechanics that has completely new and unexpected powers for processing information. So let's start with a bit of history. We're in the middle of the, or the very beginnings of the second quantum revolution. What was the first quantum revolution? It took place in the first half of the last century. And it, as I mentioned, it describes uh, behavior usually at, it's used at small scales, but uh, it also applies at larger scales. Uh, in which particles act like waves and waves act like particles. And there are very counterintuitive effects involving uncertainty and ineluctable randomness from the superposition principle. You can prepare exactly the same state, quantum state, over and over in an experiment. And the, me the measurement results in the experiment can be completely random and unpredictable. There is another uh, aspect called entanglement that I'll talk a bit more about. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance and thought it was completely too strange uh, for the quantum theory to be correct. So, you know, even though Einstein contributed many of the ideas to the that led to the creation of the quantum theory. In particular, he invented the idea that light was made of particles called photons, and uh, many other ideas he develops that were very important in the formation of the quantum theory, quantum mechanics. He was never happy with the fact that the theory didn't predict exact outcomes, only probabilities of different outcomes. And uh, he summarized this by saying, God does not play dice. But ironically, because he his work really helped lead to quantum mechanics, the big irony is that uh, it was uh, Einstein who really gave God the dice, as, as uh, people say. So 
the inventors of the quantum theory a century ago, you know, they were doing curiosity driven, com com apparently completely useless uh, fundamental research about light and atoms. There were no conceivable applications. They were doing uh, spectroscopy experiments, and this is one you can do yourself at home. You take a compact fluorescent light bulb, shine it through a little slit, and bounce it off a compact disc. And there you can see the, the white light from the, the bulb bouncing, uh, bouncing off this shiny compact disc at a certain angle. But over here at other angles, you see a blue and green and yellow and red spectral lines. And that's uh, direct evidence from an experiment you can do in your own home that the energy levels of electrons orbiting an atom are quantized, that they have only certain allowed energy levels. And when they jump down from one level to the next, they emit photons, particles of light with an energy or color that depends on the energy change. So it, for lower energy photons, it's red. For higher energy photons, it's blue. Well, this was very strange and unexpected from the classical physics point of view. Um, and very interesting, but there, there didn't seem to be any real applications. And yet the theory of uh, quantum mechanics gave us the technology revolution of the 20th century through the invention of the transistor, the laser, uh, and the atomic clock, which led to the global positioning system. So this is a beautiful illustration uh, of the benefits of fundamental research, uh, which uh, you know you get you get surprising applications from these seemingly uh, obscure research topics. But and the inventors of quantum mechanics did not foresee these practical quantum devices, and even the more practical people who invented these devices really did not foresee their applications. So here's uh, Charlie Towns in 1953 with one of the first uh, uh, atomic clocks, big complicated thing with vacuum pumps and gas sources and so forth. And uh, you know he was just doing precision spectroscopic studies of atoms and uh, realized you could make a good clock, but certainly the people who built those clocks did not foresee the invention of the global positioning system based on having such clocks in orbit around the Earth. And the fact that you can hold in your hand today a small device that can tell you the time to within about a nanosecond and your location on the Earth to a, an accuracy of a few meters. Uh, likewise, the, the people that soldered together this first very ugly and crude looking transistor in 1947 at Bell Labs in New Jersey, uh, it's a pretty big thing. It's, you know, I don't know, half an inch across and you can see some uh, wires soldered on there uh, by hand and it's pretty, <laughs> pretty ugly looking, but it worked. And uh, those people certainly could not foresee this device, uh, which contains uh, several billion uh, transistors and operates uh, much faster than this device did. And they certainly could not predict the rate of production of transistors in the world today. Every second of every day, the world produces more than 20 trillion transistors. It's just a mind boggling number. All I can say is it's a good thing they're very, very small. Otherwise, we'd run out of stuff. So amazing as these technologies are, and they did require the, the theory of quantum mechanics to understand how to build them, we've recently come to understand that these devices are not uh, as quantum as devices could be. They don't take full advantage of the power available to quantum machines. 
And that's what this second quantum revolution is all about. The, new, the big new idea is that really the, the strangest aspects of quantum theory, uncertainty, randomness, and this spooky action at a distance, uh, which seem like they, they, they give you less ability to understand the world than, was, than uh, classical mechanics, where everything is deterministic. So it seems like it's these are bugs, but we now understand there are also features which we can actually use in practical technologies. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So this second revolution now underway, I hope I've given you, uh, I've protected myself by showing you that it's impossible to foresee consequences of these kinds of revolutions. <laughs> Uh, but um, roughly speaking, it's it's like a stool uh, with three legs. One area that people are very excited about is quantum materials, building new materials whose electrons behave in strange and interesting ways because of quantum mechanics. Quantum sensing, which is a result of our new understanding of how measurements work in quantum mechanics. Are, this is leading to profound new abilities to measure the tiniest signals that you can imagine. So tiny just ripples in space-time due to gravitational waves are now uh, being detected by LIGO and uh, Virgo and other uh, wave observatories in the world. And Recently, the sensitivity of these has been dramatically increased uh, using quantum sensing techniques. And they're now seeing a uh, black hole and uh, a neutron star mergers about once a week instead of um, a couple times a year. Uh, quantum sensing is also being used to search for, uh, to try to identify the missing matter in the universe, the so-called dark matter. There's a haystack experiment at Yale doing that, for example. And other people are doing magnetic resonance imaging on single molecules, really amazing experiments. The focus of my talk is going to be on quantum computation and uh, information processing that includes uh, uh, simulation of physics science models and communication of information in secure ways. But I'm going to focus on quantum computing. And uh, there's something very important to understand is a technological challenge is that quant the states of quantum systems are extremely sensitive to external perturbations, to noise and, and small changes in the environment. That's wonderful if you're trying to build a sensor that detects those small things. It's terrible if you're trying to build a quantum computer, which uh, you don't want you uh, you don't want to, it to be perturbed. You want it don't want the results of the calculation to be affected by noise. So I'll talk more about that uh, on the under the topic of quantum error correction. So. Um, so there's a lot of hype uh, around this field right now. There are a lot of uh, startups and venture capitalists going crazy. Um, and I think we have to be extremely careful. It's going to be decades, going to take decades of basic research, mostly in academic institutions that will be needed to really give us the basics of this uh, revolutionary new technology, which will then have to be scaled up and, and made practical uh, uh, by industry. So you can, I, I love this Gartner plot of uh, expectations and, you know, the peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment. And finally, after a while, uh, people actually get it to work. Okay, so, so to summarize, the second quantum revolution now play, taking place uh, around uh, related to quantum computing, which gives us a completely new way to store and process information. 
It uses the superposition principle of quantum mechanics, just as you can be uncertain exactly where a particle is because it's acting like a wave. A, a classical bit, which is zero and one, when you make it a quantum bit in some crude sense, not literally true, but in a simple, a simplified description is it can be both zero and one at the same time. And uh, uncertainty then can be a feature rather than a bug. Uh, entanglement is another kind of superposition in which different parts of the computer can be in highly correlated states um, that um, that uh, um, give you this thing that Einstein called spooky action at a distance. It lets you teleport uh, states and gate operations from one part of a computer to another. Uh, not exactly like teleporting people in Star Trek, but teleporting quantum states of qubits. And uh, this gives you the ability to do very strange and interesting things with information processing. And one of the big ironies, as I uh, to continue talking about Einstein, is that the every morning when the experimentalists at Yale, you know, turn on their uh, experimental quantum computers, they run a routine engineering and calibration test, which is to do these spooky operations that Einstein said were impossible. And if they get them to work, then they know the quantum computer is working and it's not a classical computer. So I think if Einstein were alive today, uh, you know, he would catch on pretty quickly and be uh, very happy to see this. So this these combination of these effects leads to a kind of massive parallelism. Uh, if qubits can be in more than one state at once, that you can kind of do more than one uh, calculation at once or calculate on more than one bit of data at the same time. And it allows you, in principle, if we can build large scale quantum computers to perform computations that would be completely impossible on any conventional computer that could ever be built. And it's not because the clock speed of quantum computers is, you know, a hundred times faster than a classical computer. Uh, uh, but rather, it's they're typically the clock speed is slower, but rather there's something different about quantum hardware. And the degree, the, the way you write algorithms and the way you run them, uh, certain problems take many fewer steps uh, on, a, on a quantum computer than a classical computer. So the runtime as the size of the problem, like the size of a database or the number of particles you're following in a simulation or something, uh, perhaps it grows exponentially on classical hardware, but only grows much more slowly with the size of the problem polynomially on a quantum computer. So interestingly, we don't we aren't we don't know the full answer to what powers quantum machines have. It's still a partially open problem in the theory of quantum computer science. But the the realization that that hardware makes a difference is completely overturned the foundations of theoretical computer science. Uh, originally, people, you know, Turing and Church proved that it basically all computers are equivalent. You can simulate one computer, you can run a uh, simulate one computer with another computer. You can write a program in uh, Python language that will simulate a computer running Fortran or running Julia or some other language. They're all really equivalent. But it turns out that quantum hardware is different and uh, certain problems that are hard classically are easy on quantum computers. So computer scientists like to classify problems into sort of complexity classes. Multiplication is easy. You can do it on your cell phone. Um, the reverse problem of uh, give you a giant number and ask you what two large numbers, prime numbers I multiplied together to give you that big number. 
that's very, very hard. If I, if I tell you the two numbers, you can check the answer that's correct very, very easily. But finding the factoring that big number uh, is uh, essentially impossible for large enough numbers on a quantum computer and a classical computer. But Sh Peter Shore developed an algorithm showing that it's easy on a quantum computer. So this could break uh, the standard public key encryption that's used on the internet. Uh, but in the end, it turns out that actually quantum mechanics enhances privacy, that you can show that uh, the laws of quantum mechanics allow you to protect information, encrypt it, and communicate it in ways that can't be broken uh, without violating the laws of quantum mechanics. Uh, there are still some problems that are hard, even for a quantum computer, uh, and but we don't fully understand some of the heuristics uh, that, you know, there are plenty of problems that are formally hard on classical computers that people make money every day by solving, uh, not perfectly, but to a good approximation. And uh, we may also be able to do that with quantum computers. But ultimate, uh, you know, it's very easy to simulate the dynamics of quantum particles because they obey the equations of quantum mechanics. And that's sort of a native feature of a quantum computer. We should be able to use this for optimization problems and logistics and finance for for doing calculations in chemistry to design catalysts or drugs that will bind tightly to, to some target and so forth. Um, one really interesting thing about quantum computers is that if a quantum computer ever consumes any energy, the computation fails. They're like frictionless machines that coast to the answer. Uh, there's a little asterisk here because it turns out resetting the computer at the beginning, putting all the bits to zero, actually does take a small amount of energy. And then there's a huge amount of energy that goes into the refrigerator and the big classical computer and the classical electronics that run the quantum computer. They, they use lots of energy. But the quantum computer itself uh, uses essentially no energy, which is amazing. Um, so, so let's talk now about, before we get to quantum bits, let's talk about classical bits. So uh, Rolf Landauer at IBM was uh, famously said, information is physical. It's stored in and transmitted by physical systems. For example, here's a circuit with a battery, a switch, and a light bulb. And the two positions of the switch can represent one bit of information. Bit value zero, maybe the switch is open, and bit value one, the switch is closed. And you can transmit that fact uh, to a distant friend uh, because this light bulb lights up and carries that information through space to anyone who's uh, looking at it. Quantum information, quantum bits are physical things. And quantum information is stored in the physical states of atoms or molecules or ions or photons. So I'm going to be telling you about superconducting electrical circuits. You can also use mechanical motion. Any system that has a discrete quantized energy levels, uh, you can, say, pick the lowest two and uh, manipulate these. You can have be in this state, that's a zero, or in this state, that's a one. Uh, just like I showed you for these uh, atoms. And uh, so the, these quant this physical thing, an atom or a circuit or whatever it is, can be used to store information. Now, quantum information is quantized or, or digital or discrete because we've seen that if you measure the energy level, what energy does the atom have, you'll either get level zero or level one. And so measurement of the state of a qubit yields one classical bit of information, a zero or a one. Just as if I opened up a computer and measured the value of a bit stored in memory, I would always get either zero or one, never anything in between or both. Uh, uh, you would get zero or one. 
But quantum, inf so in that sense, quantum information looks digital, but in another sense, it's analog because of the superposition principle. It turns out that quantum bits can exist in an infinity of superposition states, which are a combination of zero and one or in between zero and one in some sense. And mathematically, we, we sort of represent those states by the position of an arrow pointing to the surface of a sphere. And uh, the latitude and, and longitude determine these uh, mathematical coefficients in this superposition. Uh, the North Pole represents uh, state zero, which we sometimes, because of this arrow, call spin up. And the South Pole represents state bit state one or the spin down. And this, this arrow we call the spin vector. And it can point anywhere on the sphere. But when you measure, if you ask the question, are you in this state or that state, you're asking, are you at the North Pole or the South Pole? And even when it's pointing here, the answer is always yes. It's either at the North Pole or the South Pole, but it can be random which one you, you observe. So unlike classical bits, the error, the states here are kind of continuous. I can rotate this arrow around on the sphere continuously on purpose, or uh, noise and other uh, effects from the environment can accidentally turn it continuously, and we're unaware of that. So both states and errors in those states are continuous. Uh, so the fact that quantum information can be in these superposition states is a feature. There's a sense, not strictly correct, but it's sort of true that the qubit can be in both states at once, both zero and one. Uh, and that can lead to, in some cases, to exponential speed up in the processing of information. That's a feature. Uh, and uh, to illustrate this, so here's a register of three bits, and here are the, the bit values. If it were a classical register, these would be the two to the three equals eight states of the register. But a quantum register can be in a giant superposition of all these possibilities at the same time, and there are quantum amplitudes, complex numbers that go in front of these. Here, I'm just illustrating them with pluses and minuses. Uh, so a quantum register can hold an exponentially large superposition of all these states. And furthermore, you can make this superposition in a single time step on the computer. So it's extremely uh, powerful possibility. So even a small, you know, your, my cell phone has billions of transistors in it, but uh, we're not at that stage yet where we have 50 to 100 uh, quantum bits in computers these days. But even a small quantum computer with 53 qubits has a space of all these states that it can be in superposition of. That's so large, it takes about a petabyte of information. Uh, that's a 10 to the 15 bytes or um, uh, 1 million gigabytes. It's such a large state space that it's extremely difficult to simulate uh, it on a conventional supercomputer to, to solve the equations of quantum mechanics to predict what the quantum computer would do becomes basically impossible when you get to uh, more than about 50 qubits. Okay, well, so that's a feature, this superposition thing, but it's also a bug because we're uncertain which state the bit is in. When you measure whether it's zero and one, you can get random results, truly random. Well, that's that actually can be a useful resource, but I mean, why would I want to build a computer where I don't know <laughs> what the value of the bit is and, and I get random junk when I measure it? Well, that seems bad. So here's an example. I take this spin vector representing the state of a qubit and it's horizontal. And I put it through a measurement that says, are you zero or one? And the answer is always yes. It comes out either one 
or zero randomly, and the state has changed by the act of measuring it. It now lies in the direction that you chose to measure, Z being uh, up and down here. And so, and you have no way of knowing that it changed. If you were, if it comes out up and you measure it again, it will be up again. There's, there's uh, the first measurement result is random. The rest uh, are the same as the first. So this so-called back action or state collapse by the act of measurement changes the state, but it's invisible to the observable, to the observer. Uh, so this seems uh, this seems very bad for using in a in a computer, uh, and this illustrates this nice concept that my friend Sasha Kurotkov likes to say that in you know quantum mechanics the results are random. It's not because inside the box there's it's the 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 result is determined as a zero or a one there you don't know which and you open the box and you 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 see what you get that's not what happens you get what you see the act of seeing the act of measuring brings the the measured value into existence it's not really true that it's both zero and one it's that it doesn't have a value until you measure it and the act of measuring creates the value so, so see there are a couple of questions maybe i, I can uh, address here sure um so there's a question by pablo giuliani uh jumping ahead maybe a couple of centuries with this question do we have an idea of a framework that could in principle, make quantum hard problems easy. Uh, so that's a that's a deep question. Uh, the uh, we don't fully understand which we know some problems that are quantum hard. We know some that are quantum easy, and there are a bunch that we're not sure. Uh, so. Uh, provided that the theory of quantum mechanics is correct, and as I said, it's the most heavily tested and precisely tested theory in all of science, uh, then the answer, then things that are quantum hard uh, will remain quantum hard no matter how big the quantum computer is we build. But there are people who are thinking about are there alternative theories to the quantum theory, other theories of probability uh, that the universe might obey, and quantum theory is only an approximation. Mm -hmm. uh, and those people are very interested in the exact question that you uh, ask, but um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to modify the quantum theory in a way that doesn't have immediate uh, falsifiable um, results that you know disagree with existing experiments. Mm -hmm. So most likely the answer is no. <laughs> now, having said that, I also mentioned that you know when a computer scientist tells you a problem is in a hard complexity class, they mean there exist versions of the problem that are hard, but. Uh, there may be heuristic methods for many cases where you can find the answer or find an approximate answer very well. So exactly what you mean by hard uh, depends on whether you're looking for a perfect answer or an approximate answer. Great. Thanks, Steve. There's a, a basic question by Cole uh, Scheller uh, asking about the notation. He wants to know what the, 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 the cat notation, what, what, what this thing with the the symbol. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, oh, up here. Okay, it's up at the top of the page here. So this this just means a quantum state. It's a notation invented by uh, Paul Dirac, and uh, it refer and it, and the little arrow is referring to which way that spin is pointing on the on the sphere. So this is the state at the North Pole, and that's the state at the South Pole, and weirdly. A state with the spin vector pointing at the equator can be written as a superposition, a, a sum of two different states, one at the North Pole and one at the South Pole. Great. Thank you, Steve. Yep. Okay. So, um, so all of this seems, uh, this aspect seems very bad for building a computer. Uh, 
And uh, so, yes, I can put an exponentially large superposition of all the possible input states I could ever give the computer into the input. And so since this includes all the possibilities, the answer to our calculation is already in the state. Um, but uh, if you make a measurement of the output of the quantum computer when it's in this giant superposition state, you'll almost all, you'll get a completely random bit spring string, sometimes this one, sometimes that one, sometimes this one. Uh, and the probability that you get the correct answer uh, is, is exponentially small, okay? So um, we need some way to build a quantum algorithm that will fix that problem. And quantum algorithms, uh, so how do they produce useful results instead of random results like I just showed you? Well, <clears throat> quantum particles have wave-like properties, as I told you. Uh, I haven't exactly explained to you what uh, about a qubit is wave-like, but roughly uh, the fact that, that that arrow on the sphere that I showed you can point in a bunch of different directions and be up or down uh, is related to this wave-like aspect. So when you have waves, like water waves, if they're, you two of them come together and they're in phase, that their peaks and troughs are aligned, then you get a wave with twice as much amplitude. You get constructive interference, more intensity. And higher intensity, let's say, of a light wave means a higher probability of seeing a photon uh, at that place where the wave intensity is higher. And in the quantum computer, it means seeing a particular bit string that is the correct answer if you have used constructive interference to enhance that. Destructive interference, you can have two waves that are out of phase with each other. The troughs and peaks are aligned, and then you can get zero. That's destructive interference. That means there's a lower, almost no probability of seeing this result in the answer. So this is just a kind of hand-waving analogy. It's very hard to really <laughs> explain how this works. But the, the basic idea of what a quantum computer program is supposed to do is you, most algorithms start by making an equal superposition of all the possible states you can have. And these coefficients in front are these wave-like amplitudes. Sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative, sometimes they're complex numbers. And then you, you, you process these waves and combine them in, in clever ways to produce interference that's destructive to the wave amplitudes in front of all the wrong answers and constructive in front of the for the wave amplitudes that are the right answer and then the measurement of the output will yield the correct answer with high probability uh, so it, you know it's kind of like a programmable diffraction grading where you like that compact disc i showed you which worked in in by reflecting waves in different ways here's one that transmits waves in different ways and you have the input and the, the waves are spreading out and they're combining with other waves and you arrange the holes in, in this screen so that you get constructive interference in the output register at the bit string that is the right answer and very little amplitude for all the wrong answers. So it's a kind of programmable diffraction grading. But the grand challenge of quantum algorithm development is it's it's pretty weird. We don't, you know, have a lot of intuition about how these algorithms should be developed we, because we have to make this correct diffraction uh, grading for problems where we don't know the answer. You know, that's why we're writing algorithms to run on a quantum computer because we don't know the answer and we want to run it and get it correctly. So how you do that is pretty... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, interesting challenge, but there people are slowly learning tricks of the trade to write these quantum algorithms to solve difficult problems. 
Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about quantum hardware. There are many kinds of systems uh, that can hold quantum information, trapped ions, cold atoms. I'm going to talk to you about superconducting electronic circuits. These are uh, handcrafted by uh, graduate students in physics and uh, applied physics and electrical engineering these days. Uh, and they have to sit inside this complicated refrigerator that cools it down near absolute uh, zero. So the very first electronic, all electronic quantum processor was built by my colleagues, Michelle and Rob at Yale uh, only 13 years ago. Here's the, the little quantum computer chip uh, and there's a qubit here and a qubit here, and this wiggly wire connecting them is uh, is a kind of waveguide that, that allows them to talk to each other by sending microwave photons back and forth. And this little quantum computer chip, which has only two qubits on it, was lithographically produced uh, as an integrated circuit, just, uh, just like in your um, integrated circuit uh, the, today, uh, but not with semiconductors, with superconductors, in this case, aluminum, which you cool down very close to absolute zero. It loses all its electrical resistance. And so the information lives for a long time in, inside the excitations of the uh, artificial atoms, the quantum bits, uh, and uh, as also as microwave photons. And all the current industrial systems uh, being built in the world today are direct massive engineering scale ups of this first very crude device from only 13 years ago. Uh, so here's uh, my former student, Daniel Stank, with uh, the head of uh, Google, with you can see a much bigger machine here. Uh, here's Chad Rigetti, who was a postdoc with Michelle Devere, has a startup company in uh, Berkeley. This is uh, Honey Pike now at IBM, along with many of our other graduates. And you see these huge, uh, fancy uh, machines that they're developing. Many, many companies and startups are now uh, working in this area. So what is our synthetic atom, our artificial atom? It's uh, called a transmon qubit. It's, uh, it's about a millimeter in size. So it's a gigantic artificial atom. It's made of uh, two pieces of two films of aluminum evaporated on sapphire uh, uh, like this. And then there's a little tiny thing here, the, the Josephson Tunnel Junction which is uh, uh, about 2,000 atoms on a side. And as a piece of aluminum, an insulating aluminum oxide tunnel barrier, and then another piece of aluminum. And uh, the excitations of this artificial atom are pairs of electrons called Cooper pairs, sloshing back and forth between these two antenna pads which allows this atom to talk very efficiently to microwaves. Uh, and they can emit and absorb not visible light, like I showed you in that on the first slide uh, with the uh, light bulb, but rather microwave light, uh, what, similar frequency to is what's used in your cell phone, about five gigahertz. So why do we have to cool these things down near absolute zero? Well, the aluminum uh, has electrical resistance until you cool it below about one Kelvin and it becomes a superconductor and there's no more friction. The electrons can slosh back and forth for a very long time. Uh, so you need a refrigerator. Uh, and the second reason is that the energy of microwave photons, the, the excitation of the atom takes a microwave photon with a frequency of about five gigahertz. That energy corresponds to the kind of thermal energy excitations that are running around in the, in the electrons uh, when the temperature is about one quarter of a degree above absolute zero. So we need to cool to a hundredth of a degree to be much, much colder than this. Otherwise, the atom, artificial atom will be blinded 
by all the black body radiation in the air. It's like you staring up at the sun, which is, has a temperature of about 3000 Kelvin and emits uh, you know, yellow light, as you can see here. Uh, we're way, way down here, uh, 100,000 times lower in uh, temperature. And uh, we have to cool our qubits to, to that temperature or they'll just get fried. Uh, so a refrigerator maybe costs $1,500 for your kitchen. A refrigerator that'll get to a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero is about three quarters of a million dollars. You can get a radio for much less than a hundred dollars, but the kind of microwave electronics that we use is much more expensive. So this is not a cheap uh, proposition. And as we scale up to more and more qubits, we have to find ways to more cheaply produce the microwave signals at all these different frequencies that we need. So it's an interesting engineering problem. Okay. Um, so uh, the huge information content that you can build in these quantum superpositions in these superconducting qubits at low temperature comes with a price. And, and I mentioned it earlier, it's the great sensitivity to noise, perturbations, and dissipation, friction, if you will. And uh, they can continuously perturb the state of the quantum information, that is, move this little arrow around on the sphere without you knowing about it. You tried to put it on the equator, and it moved up to here, maybe. So that's dangerous. The errors are continuous. And in that sense, quantum computers are, are analog machines. Here's a, an engineer uh, in, at General Dynamics in 1964 programming an analog computer by plugging all these wires <laughs> together. Here's uh, perhaps the world's first analog computer for calculating the uh, positions of the planets. It's gotten a little rusty since it was under uh, water for uh, 2,000 years before it was found. Um, and so, so this is very different from digital computation. If you have a voltage in a digital circuit, anything close to zero is counted as a bit value zero. If you get a little noise, doesn't matter. Anything close to one volt, uh, it, a little noise, you still call it a one, okay? And uh, but in a in an analog computer where you're trying to use the, the voltage varies continuously and there's no concept of, of you know zeros and ones, um, there's a no go theorem that says that you cannot do error correction because any allowed voltage value is a perfectly allowed uh, state of the analog computer. So you can show that as you operate the analog computer, the fidelity, the, the rate uh, at which you uh, keep track of the information without errors goes down and down and down and down exponentially. Well, that's bad. If quantum computers act like analog machines, it seems impossible to correct errors. Uh, so uh, there are errors. So how, what is the error correction problem? So I'm going to give you an unknown quantum state. You're not allowed to know what it is because I plucked it out of the middle of a, the running a quantum algorithm, let's say. And uh, if you measure it to look for an error, I've showed you that it'll change randomly due to this state collapse or back action. So that's that. how we're going to identify the error. And your task is, if this qubit develops an error, fix it. It seems impossible. But um, miraculously, it can be done, as uh, the fine print here, in principle. We're just beginning to learn how to do it. And we must learn how to do it if we're going to build large-scale quantum computers, because they do always have small errors. So the, the, I showed you that analog machines can't correct errors. But quantum machines are also digital, because so errors can develop continuously. But when you measure them, they become discrete. And so again, it's this thing that Sasha says that in quantum mechanics, you don't see what you get, you get what you see. If you look uh, and see that there was no error, then even if there was an error before, there isn't one now because you didn't, you saw that there wasn't one. <laughs> if you uh, look, 
and ask, was there an error? The answer is always yes or no. And so that, that discreteness is what lets us do error correction. But the, you have to do it very, very carefully. The trick is to measure what error occurred without measuring the unknown state in which the error occurred. That would collapse the information you're trying to preserve. And it's uh, very subtle, but it can be done. Uh, so here's, uh, we're just beginning to learn how to do this. And uh, the first uh, error correction engine that just barely worked, that made things very slightly better, uh, was done uh, by Rob Sholkoff in, uh, only six years ago. Uses very high speed electronics, all kinds of fancy um, signal processing on, on scales of hundreds of nanoseconds. And uh, a significant part of this 200 nanosecond latency is the speed of light travel time for the signals to go from the computer outside the refrigerator down to the quantum computer and back up to the classical computer outside the, uh, the refrigerator. So this is very, very fast electronics. So uh, we're just beginning to learn how to do that. The latest, uh, the current world record uh, is held by my other experimental colleague, Michelle Deveray, who's made the information live twice as long by error correction than, than uh, without it. Uh, we need it to be 10 or 100,000 times longer, but uh, this is the really the first experiment that clearly made things better. So we're still in the very early basic research stages. Uh, but now you're all experts, I hope. And so here's a quiz, but don't worry, I'll give you the answers. Is quantum information carried by waves or particles? Of course, the answer is yes. Uh, is quantum information analog or digital? Yes. <laughs> um, and so I hope uh, I've convinced you that quantum mechanics is strange and different. Information is carried by waves and particles. It's analog and digital. And quantum error correction is possible, and we're just beginning to learn how to do it. The quantum hardware is still very crude. It, it's kind of analogous to this first transistor. It works, but it's not really useful yet. We have a very, very long way to go to realize the promise of this second quantum revolution, which is based on not on a that quantum mechanics has changed or we realize it's been replaced by another theory. It's just that it was so weird that it took us uh, almost 100 years to realize that we weren't taking full advantage of quantum weirdness as a feature. So I'm happy to uh, take your questions now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. That was a wonderful talk. Um... There are some questions. Well, there's one question that we haven't asked yet. Um, so there's a question by Steve Keeling. Uh, do you feel that treating quantum com computing in analogy with classical computing as on your slide 18 might be holding us back in a way? In other words, your slide 21 on the block sphere may imply that there are more that there may be a more useful mental model of quantum comp computation, though I admit I have no idea what that new idea might be. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. As I said, it, it, people are struggling to learn how to invent algorithms to run on quantum computer that will take full advantage of the, uh, the power. And you know, everybody has a certain picture in their head of how the quantum states are are being affected as you take this run the steps in the program. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that there's some better mental picture which will be very clarifying and help us learn how to write better algorithms. Absolutely. And I'm hoping some young person will invent it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. There's a question by Jian Ling Chen. Uh, do you foresee quantum computers solving the uh, solving NP hard problems? Uh, no. So um, that's unlikely to be uh, possible in general. Uh, but I, I'm not an expert on this. But um, my my uh, understanding is that uh, we can't 
expect that to be uh, possible. But as I said, uh, it may be possible for problems that are uh, uh, even problems that are quantum hard that we may be able to use heuristic methods just as we do in classical computers to rapidly approximately solve such problems in a way that's still economically or scientifically useful. Okay. Thank you, Steve. And there's a there's a few more questions. Uh, question by Tamerlan Bainmarat. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Exclamation mark. How exactly should the temperature be maintained to prevent errors? Ah, uh, so um, as I said, the refrigerator has to cool down to a a, a temperature of about a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero, which is about. Uh, um let's see uh you know a 25th of the of the sort of characteristic energy it takes to excite the artificial atom so that it's very cold and it'll just sit in its ground state um not being excited by stray thermal excitations and uh these refrigerators are very expensive but even i can op as a theorist can operate them you close them up and you push a button on the wall and 24 hours later, it's cold. That's as far as I know how it works. <laughs> so it's it's a it sounds difficult, but uh, it's actually maybe the least difficult part of the experiment these days. I mean, it used to be you had to do all kinds of things to keep the refrigerator working and feed it with liquid helium and do all kinds of stuff. But now it's all been kind of commercialized into a routine uh, package that just makes it cold for you. Okay. There's a clarifying question from Utkal uh, Pandurangi. In one of the earlier slides, Professor Stephen uh, mentioned quantum, com quantum computers do not use energy. How is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so um, so my friend, uh, it's also possible for classical computers in principle to not use energy. And my friend, uh, Charlie Bennett, who may actually be in the audience um, from IBM, uh, invented this concept of reversible computing. Uh, you have to have all the gates have to have as many outputs as inputs, like, like an AND gate, which has two inputs and one output. That's not reversible. You can't run it backwards to figure out the, what you had at the beginning. But um, so even classical computers don't necessarily have to use any energy except in initializing them or erasing the information at the end. And uh, it's and so it's uh, uh, the the computers, you know, the transistors in in the computer chip in your cell phone or your computers use uh, just huge amounts of energy, but it's only because we don't, it's not required in principle. In principle, it could be much, much, much less. Uh, so, you you know, uh, when Charlie Bennett came up with this idea, uh, some people designed sort of imagined frictionless billiard balls uh, being arranged very cleverly and having them collide and showed you could do calculations with those classical calculations. So it's not really the quantum computer that's um, uh, only the quantum computer that's uh, dissipationless. But the quantum computers we use are much closer to being dissipationless than the classical computers that exist today. Thank you, Steve. Maybe we'll take two more. There are, there are more questions, but we shouldn't keep going. But uh, there's a question by Cedric Emanuel. Can we have a quantum computer that uses uh, qubits or generalized qubits that have three possible states, like a nucleus with minus one, zero, one spin? Then we could have three to the n possible states. Absolutely. So these are called qubits instead of qubits, and they have d levels instead of a binary two levels. And um, uh, you can use the nuclei and atoms that can have, uh, certain atoms have 17, um, uh, you know, they have spin eight, so 17 states. Uh, 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 Yesen, an experimentalist at the University of Arizona, um, can manipulate those 17 states. Uh, 
for example. Uh, we use, um, so this transmon qubit has two, has lots of levels, not just the two lowest. And we often use the third level to help us um, do certain operations in a way that um, reduces the probability of errors. Um, so yeah, the, using more levels is, um, is a good trick. And in fact, the best way that we use it is by uh, storing the information in microwave cavities where you can have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 photons. We use all those levels and to replace many physical qubits with one single quantum object that has many levels. So the, uh, and that actually uh, helps us um, make the hardware more efficient because there are fewer moving parts for still have lots of states. Okay, the, the very last question is by Sergio uh, Ulio. Uh, when you or Sasha say that you get what you see, do you mean that it is only the active observation by a person or a human that produces the active measurement? I mean, it is not a knob turned by a device, but the knowledge acquired by a human. Yeah, that's a thank you, Sergio. A long time no see. Nice, nice to hear from you. Um, no, I mean, it doesn't have to be uh, a human that learns the information. The environment could learn the information. So, for example, um, if you had an atom and it's in the it's in a superposition of the ground and excited state. And it emits a photon out into the environment, but you don't, you don't, it doesn't happen to go into your eye, so you don't see it. The environment still knows that the that the qubit was in the excited state, collapsed to the excited state, emitted the photon, and is now in the ground state. So um, it, it doesn't literally have to be a human observer, it's just anything in the environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much, Steve. Um, so thank you everybody for joining in for this wonderful uh, lecture and discussion. Um, those of you who want to maybe hang around uh, and ask some questions in private for a few minutes, we can do that, but otherwise I'll stop the recording.